Hello everyone, my name is Gerald. I'm an engineer and advocate here at HashiCorp. And today we're gonna to be talking about workflows. Maybe you've heard people use the phrase workflows over technologies, but it's oftentimes lumped in with a lot of the other buzzwords we often hear. Digital transformation, zero trust, the list goes on. In this video, we're gonna try and shed some light on what workflows actually are and why we need to give them the proper attention when building software. A workflow is simply the combination of people, process, and technology used to accomplish a given task. Within the context of this video, the task we're seeking to accomplish is building software and actually getting that software released to users, to customers, so that it can be useful to people. Now, as you all know, as we build software and as more users come in, the task of building the software becomes much more complex. As your user base grows, the needs also grow. And in order to meet this demand, we oftentimes have to increase the amount of people on teams in order to create the features that our users want. And as we increase the amount of people, we face very real challenges because people are pretty complex. And the mistake we oftentimes run into is that we pay less attention to the people in process and we tend to hyper focus on the technology. Now that makes sense. We are all kind of technologists. We love technology, but it's important to understand how the technology really supports the people in process when accomplishing the task of application delivery. Now here at HashiCorp, we have what's called the cloud operating model, which breaks down infrastructure automation into four key workflows. Now I'm sure all of you realize that infrastructure is a very difficult part of application delivery. I would argue it's about 80% of the pain that we face when actually trying to deliver software. The four workflows are simply, how does my application get infrastructure? How's that infrastructure provisioned? How do we provide secure access to our applications and our people? How do we securely connect our applications over the network? And how do we go about running our applications? Now that we know some key workflows that are involved in the cloud operating model and how we manage our infrastructure, let's look at an example of what a provisioning workflow may look like. And then we'll talk about and analyze how we can maybe make that workflow a bit better. All right, so now we're going to actually look at an example provisioning workflow. We're gonna keep it simple for the sake of this video. We understand that this can be much more complex. We've seen much more complex workflows. But hopefully this will serve to illustrate how a provisioning workflow could look and then maybe some of the things that we can consider when evaluating our own provisioning workflow. Let's go ahead and jump into it. All right, so the first thing is we want to identify the trigger event. The trigger event is usually as a development team, we also encourage you to look at the perspective of the development team since they're the one really having to release features and dependent upon other teams in order to do so. Let's say that we need some form of infrastructure, right? This could be anything as simple as a VM all the way up to complex, you know, uh, cluster of some sort, etc. cetera. Okay? Now, what's the first thing that often happens? The first thing that often happens is we have to notify some other team that we're dependent on via a request of some sort. So this request could be an email. It could be a ticket of some sort uh, via JIRA or ServiceNow, et cetera. And then once we actually have that request, we have to submit it to another team. This team could be any team, but for example, we're just gonna say, let's say, you know, we have to submit it to the security team first. And let's say in this example, we want an Azure subscription. We're trying to gain access to Azure and be able to create resources, or maybe we need some specific resources created on our behalf. So at the very first, we need an Azure subscription. So let's send our email or ticket to perhaps the security team and they receive the ticket. And then at that point, that kicks off their backlog on workflow to where they go ahead and you know create the subscription. At that point, they may send a response, send a response to dev team saying, hey, your subscription is created. Awesome. 
And then that goes back to the development team, right? At this point, the dev may gain access. Now, from the developer's perspective, this is all that they really see happening. What they didn't see happening is that also behind the scenes, before we even gave them the subscription, the security team ended up sending another ticket in order to get some very foundational networking resources created in our Azure subscription. So actually, when they created the subscription, they also then submitted a request to go ahead and move some of this over so we can get this in here. Right. They submit some sort of request at this point to networking, networking request in the form of a ticket, email, etc. Networking receives that ticket, receives, you know, ticket in this case. And then at that point, that's when, get some space here. Once they receive the ticket, they actually start work, you know, create, create networking resources. And then at that point, sends back, hey, we're good, we're done, you can move on with your stuff. So I'll say it receives, go ahead to the security team. At that point, now that's when really the response is sent to the dev team and the developers actually gain access. Now this is just, a, it gets more complex than this, right? But we're gonna try and keep this simple for now. Now what, we're, what we wanna take into consideration here is that each of these, we'll call them cycles, take their own amount of time. And let's illustrate that, right? So with uh, the security team, for example, in order to create the subscription and get out that networking request, just the creating of the subscription process may take one or two days because this team has their own backlog and things to accomplish. We'll go ahead and make this a different color. Then once you send that request down to networking, let's say networking is really quick about it, right? Let's say it only takes them a day on average, right? Now, once we actually get this set back up and let's say, oh, security, a lot of the time now, what we didn't even factor in here, has to go ahead and create and provision users with the appropriate credentials. So let's add that in there. Let's say we have to, you know, create, create users, uh, you know, maybe an AD, et cetera. So that also may take us amount of time. Let's say that that takes another one or two days. Security is really bogged down. They got a lot of work to do, All right? So let's go ahead and say that this takes another one, two, two days. Right? At this point is when the developer actually gains access and they're just now able to start creating something. They haven't started doing anything yet. So we spent a total anywhere between three and five days just on prep work before we can start provisioning infrastructure. Yeah, and, and we're just getting started. And I'm sure a lot of you understand this frustration, right? Now at this point, it starts to get interesting. In a lot of places, the devs, once they gain access, they're able to just go in and create resources, whatever they want to create, go in and create whatever, right? Some organizations are like that. But then there's other things that the developers have to consider at this point for their application that would kick off this cycle again of going to security, going to networking, et cetera. Like, for example, does uh, my application require, you know, some private endpoint? Let's see. Uh, yes or no? If so, then we need to submit a request to networking. We'll get into that in a second. Uh, is there some sort of custom request outside of the boundaries of what the teams have usually been working on or has been allowed at this point? That's under this kind of custom requests uh, catch-all we'll put here. Okay. Custom requests. Okay. So at this point, if it's a custom request, that also is going to take a significant amount of time. It took five days, up to five days, just to get a subscription and gain access. 
if it's, and that's things that our organization's used to doing. So a custom request, we, we often see stuff like that take in maybe two weeks, you know, give or take, sometimes a lot more. We've seen it take up to, uh, I've seen some organizations it takes up to six months or so, you know, but let's just put, you know, two weeks, give or take. Private endpoint, we'll say that also takes, you know, around a week. We'll say that takes around one week, right? And all of these trigger that same request structure uh, that was there before. So for a private endpoint, we have to submit a private endpoint request, request to networking. Uh, for this custom request, we have to have, you know, different custom request meetings with both networking and with security. All of that stuff takes time, custom request meetings, etc. And still at the end of this, after all these discussions, after the architectural discussions, etc., we have to repeat a large amount of this app to app, every single app we're trying to create. And this bogs down an organization's ability to really deliver software quickly. Now, there is a good side of this. I'm not trying to hate on this because this was really in place, I think, with the intention of making sure that we're delivering our software safely. We have users to be concerned about. We have to do so safely so that we protect our users' data and our privacy, right? So it's important, but it doesn't have to take this long, okay? Now that we understand a high-level workflow, we can start to analyze and look at, okay, what are key areas that we can actually maybe make more efficient. So I'm gonna highlight just some key areas and maybe just how we think at a high level, right? Because we wanna keep this video as short as possible. But let me, let me take my little rectangle container here and let's put it around this private endpoint as an example. This takes one week now with how we're currently doing it. So now we have this private endpoint. How can we add automation into this private endpoint workflow? Perhaps we can take this and use Terraform modules to uh, enhance how we provision private endpoints. We've seen stuff like this cut down something from a week to at the best case minutes, but even if it's a couple days, that's still better than a week. I wanna take a second too, just to say that Looking at this now gives you an understanding into how your organization works, why certain policies were in place, and a foundation point to now talk to each team and understand what they're concerned about and why we're approaching things the way that we are. That understanding will then help us to create new policies, new automation that can accommodate everyone's needs. And we do the same maybe for these custom requests we're talking about specifically the provisioning workflow here. So for custom requests, now we can do something maybe in a more collaborative way instead of in a silo way and collaborate on how these Terraform modules can help us standardize how we handle custom requests and even use something like the Terraform module registry, private registry, to make it easily consumable for our teams. So let's do that. Let's say... Uh, you know, use Terraform modules and uh, private registry for easy consumption right. and put that there. And this is really that foundational point where we can figure out what other tools would be useful to bring into our process as an organization to make sure that we can deliver these applications as quickly and safely as possible. I really hope that this video was useful, at least as a conversation starter in your organization. We really appreciate you coming by and listening. Hope everyone has a good day. See you later.